Let's move on to case number four. A 15-year-old male presents after being stabbed several times. So penetrating wounds. Vital signs, blood pressure is a bit low, heart rate's a bit high, respiratory rate's a bit high, and the oxygen saturation is low as well. Exam demonstrates a patient in distress, multiple puncture wounds in the torso, back, arms, and legs. He has decreased breath sounds on the right and muffled heart sounds. You perform an E-FAST exam. This is a sub xiphoid view of the heart. Liver on top, kind of a four chamber view. Right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium, right atrium, a little aortic view in the middle. And does the patient have a pericardial effusion? Answer is yes, a small one, not, ca not causing tamponade. Here is the left lung. Rib shadow, rib shadow. No notice we're using a linear array for a really nice definition. Here's the intercostal muscle. And here's the pleural line. There's an A line below, nice sliding. Right lung. This one can be somewhat confusing. You have a rib here, shadow. And so it almost looks like there is pleural movement here, but if you really focus on the pleura, there is no sliding, no common tail artifacts. Here's an A-line, so different than the other side. Right upper quadrant, liver, kidney, spine. Is there a spine sign? Nope, no spine sign. It ends right here at the diaphragm. Is there intra-abdominal fluid? Nope. Left upper quadrant, spleen, kidney, spine, diaphragm. Is there a spine sign? Nope. No hemothorax. Is there an intra-abdominal fluid seen? Mm, I could call this negative. Maybe it looks like maybe there's a little trace fluid here. Maybe. And bladder is a transverse bladder review. So it kind of looks like a square. Is there fluid below it or anterior? I'll call that negative. So what are the two key sonographic diagnoses in this patient? We had a pericardial fusion without tamponade, and we had a pneumothorax on the left, I believe it was. So what's the next best step in management? It would be needle decompress the chest. We need to relieve that pneumothorax. We need to improve the ven ventilatory status of this patient. And then we can do other things. Does not need pericardiocytesis. He's not in tamponade. Doesn't need to go to the operating room right now. And um, we may need blood for the patient. Um, but remember, we need to improve airway stuff first. You place a chest tube on the right side. Oh, maybe I got my left and right confused earlier. Sorry about that. The patient now appears to be breathing better, but is still in distress. Repeat vital signs now are, so more hypotensive, more tachycardic. That's not good. But the respiratory rate in the O2 set has improved. Okay, so we improved one thing, but haven't fixed something else, it seems. Let's repeat the cardiac ultrasound. So everyone should say, uh-oh, we have liver. Here's the right ventricle. Here's the left ventricle. Right atrium, left atrium. And this is a rather large pericardial fluid collection. It is not simple, it is complex. There is this gray stuff swooshing around inside of it. That is clotted blood. Clotted blood in the pericardial sac is a very bad thing. It's gonna squish this right ventricle. It, then this right ventricle cannot fill with blood. That blood will back up, and that's why we call it obstructive shock. This patient's in cardiac tamponade. Problem with clotted blood, not easy to suck that out with a needle. So often these patients need to go to the operating room, get a pericardial window, or just have the whole pericardium removed. So what's the sonographic diagnosis? I gave it to you. Pericardial effusion with tamponade. So what's the next best step of management? Somewhat depends on how quickly you can get them to the operating theater or room. But if you can't get them there right away, just do a pericardiosynthesis and then try to get them to the operating room so they can make that window or remove uh, the pericardium. 
Case number six is a 14-year-old female who presents for a cough, fever, and shortness of breath. Her vital signs are blood pressure 110 over 80, heart rate 120, respiratory rate 20, oxygen saturation 92%, and temp is 39 degrees Celsius. Patient is not in respiratory, respiratory distress, has crackles in the right lung field. You perform a bedside ultrasound of both lungs. Oh, here's the left lung. We have a lot of depth here. We're using a curved probe, as you can see. So we're looking for pleural sliding here. Do you see sliding? Yes, you do. You see many A-lines as well. That nice reverberation artifact with sliding usually means that's a normal looking lung. Ooh, here's the right lung. And we seem to be sort of at the right lung base. And I say that because I can see liver and I can see diaphragm. And we have this thing quivering, looks like trying to breathe. This is all lung tissue. And then all this hyperechoic stuff inside the lung tissue. And then this anechoic stuff is pleural fluid. So what this is, is most likely with a patient who has cough and fever, this is pneumonia, where we have pus filling up the lung. And when pus fills up the lung, it tends to look like a solid organ, very similar to the liver, but not exactly the same. It has these really hyperechoic portions within it. That's a key that it is the lung because this is air trapped inside this sort of pus filled lung. And this is what we call a perineumonic effusion in the setting of pneumonia. So what's the diagnosis? And we, of course, we said pneumonia. So you provide treatment, including IV fluids. How would you evaluate the, with ultrasound to see if the patient can tolerate more IV fluids? Now we may want to give more IV fluids because the patient could be septic and may be in shock and, and needs to be volume resuscitated. And uh, in any patient, we want to know before we give them a bunch of IV fluid what their cardiac function is, because if their cardiac, cardiac function is very poor, then that fluid is not going to stay in the intravascular space. It's going to go to the extravascular space, like in the lungs. And then all of a sudden, our respiratory status has gotten worse because of something we did. We want to evaluate the lungs and see after our initial fluid bolus whether there's a whole bunch of B lines now, because if there are a whole bunch of B lines after initial fluid bolus, I don't want to give more because again, I'm going to worry about me worsening that respiratory status with fluid I'm giving getting into the lungs. And then we can evaluate the inferior vena cava. If it's flat and collapsing, then most likely the patient can tolerate more fluids and may need more fluids. But if it is very plethoric, very large and distended and not moving with respiratory variation, then uh, let's hold on the fluids for a bit. So it's all of the above. All right, case seven. Four-year-old female presents in respiratory distress. She has a fever, appears to be in shock. You begin fluid resuscitation in order tests, but her condition rapidly deter deteriorates. You're able to do a quick ultrasound. Here's her right and left lung. Linear array again, and here's the pleural line. You see sliding in comet tails, pleural line here, sliding in comet tails. Patient worsens and you have to intubate the patient. All right. The patient improves transiently after intubation, but then becomes more difficult to ventilate and hypoxic. Her lung sounds are more pronounced on the right than the left. Her left lung now looks like this. So you should be asking yourself several questions. The primary question is why is she hard to ventilate? Why is she become more hypoxic? Here's the pleural line, and here's the pleural line, and here's the pleural line. There's ribs in between. Because I can see some movement of the pleural line, and because I can see cometal artifacts, my primary question of does the patient have a pneumothorax is answered. She does not. Then why is the patient hard to ventilate and more hypoxic, and why can I not hear breath sounds very well on the left side? Well, we just intubated the patient, and sometimes when we intubate patients, the tube goes a little deep. It can go into the right main stem bronchus most commonly. And that means that the right side or the right lung is being ventilated, but the left, left lung may not be. Often we rely on chest X-ray to tell us whether this is the case, but you can tell an ultrasound because what's happened here is this pleural line is present because you can see a beat to it. Do you see how it's got like a rhythm to it? That is actually the patient's heart rate. So you can actually see the heart rate through the lungs because it's being transmitted from the heart and the big blood vessels. We call this a lung pulse. 
the pulse of the lung, but it's not moving, not sliding back and forth because it's not being ventilated. So what I wanna do is I wanna pull back that endotracheal tube nice and slow until I see sliding of the lung. And then I know that the patient's being ventilated properly bilaterally. So the diagnosis here, it is right main stem intubation. We know how to fix that. You deflate the tube, deflate the cuff of the tube, pull back maybe a centimeter, see where we're at, reinflate, and hopefully we're now ventilating the patient properly. What is the next best step of management? Pull back the endotracheal tube. Case number eight. Eight-year-old female presents with several days of shortness of breath, fever, and cough. Here's the vital signs. So tachycardic, respiratory rate high, SpO2 low, temperature high. The patient appears ill, dehydrated, with decreased breath sounds on the left. Start with the parasternal long view. Right ventricle here to review, left ventricle, left atrium. Here's the aortic valve and aortic outflow tract. If I were to pick one way to improve this image, I'd say, can we reduce the depth, please? What do you think about the function of this left ventricle? I would say normal. It is contracting really, really well, almost maybe hypercontractile. Hypercontractile is when the endocardium actually touches and pushes out as much blood as possible. So this might be a hypercontractile heart. The anterior leaflet is definitely hitting the septum every time of the mitral valve. Is there pericardial fluid collection? There is. There's a little anechoic collection of fluid. And I would say that when you look at the free wall, the right ventricle, it looks a little bit weird how it's coming in so deep. The patient's so tachycardic, it's really hard to tell whether this is signs of early tamponade or not. Because I want to, for early tamponade, you really need collapse of that free wall of the right ventricle during diastole. When do I know when diastole is happening? Well, the mitral valve needs to be open. So let's do this little trick. You can do this on the machine too. Here, the mitral valve is now open and the right ventricle is expanded. So that looks normal. Let's see, what else? Now, let's go when the right ventricle is actually collapsing. Here we go. Right, collapse. So here's the right ventricle is collapsing now, and the mitral valve is actually open a little bit. So that now makes me concerned for maybe early tamponade. Oh, and here again, the next beat we see collapse, and that mitral valve is definitely open. So I'm concerned about, about early tamponade on this patient. I don't know why that pericardial fluid's there. But it's a concern. We need to watch this patient really closely. Here's the right upper quadrant view of the abdomen, liver, spine, diaphragm. Is there a spine sign? Nope. No fluid in the chest. Kidneys here. I don't see all of Morrison's pouch. So this is not a really perfect view. We need to see all of Morrison's pouch and we have to see the liver tip. Those are the most sensitive places for intra-abdominal free fluid. Oh, here's the right lung. So this is kind of like, not the base of the lung, we already saw that, but this would be more kind of the apex perhaps, or lateral uh, upper portions of the lung. And do we see sliding of the lung? We do, definitely something's moving up here, so no pneumothorax, but does it look normal, this pleura? Nope, definitely doesn't look normal. We have what we would describe as a small subpleural consolidation here. We have several diffuse B lines coming from the pleural line. Subpleural consolidations usually indicate pneumonia. Now pneumonia can be viral, fungal, or bacterial. Fungal is uncommon, so we kind of narrow it down to bacterial or viral. And subpleural consolidations that are less than a centimeter are typically viral, but can be early bacterial pneumonia. So we need to just think about that. But this definitely seems like some sort of primary pulmonary, pulmonary problem. Oh, and here's the left lung base. Uh-oh. This definitely looks abnormal. So here we have anechoic fluid, that's pleural effusion. And then this is similar to another patient we saw, but a bit different. This looks like a solid organ, almost like the liver. 
So remember, think about pneumonia when you see that. Except all these hyperechoic, you know, little spots and parts in here, that's all air trapped in the bronchioles inside the sort of pus-filled lung. Now, the differential is not just one, not just pneumonia. Um, other things can look like this, like primarily masses, malignancy, you know, will look very much like this. Uh, and here's the upper portion of the left lung. So that was the lower portion, there's the upper portion. Oh man, it's just this, the whole lung is consolidated. Looks like a solid organ with all these air, this trapped air inside of it. I guess you can see the spine behind it. Definitely a positive spine sign here. Spine and ribs. Uh, another view of the heart, so apical four chamber. Uh, you can now uh, see that pericardial fluid collection here, next to the left ventricle, here's the right ventricle. And then look at the right atrium. Right atrial view uh, is really helpful in evaluation for tamponade because the right ventricular collapse during diastole is pretty sensitive for early tamponade, but collapse of the right atrium during uh, systole is extremely specific for cardiac tamponade. And if you look at this free wall, you can actually see a little bit of bowing of that right atrium into here. So that, again, does look like early tamponade. All right, most likely diagnosis. Definitely pneumonia, and I'm still concerned about pericardial fusion of tamponade. What's the best initial management? Yeah, I would do IV fluid, bolus, and antibiotics. Sometimes you fluid resuscitate these patients, um, and those, those signs of that early tamponade may improve transiently, and they really need antibiotics for their pneumonia. Um, pericarcentesis in this particular patient, I would hold off and see which way this goes. It's not like a patient's pericardium that's filling up with blood. It's kind of like, I don't know, this is happening for a metabolic or infectious reason. Most sensitive cardiac view for ruling out pericardial effusion. It would be the sub xiphoid view. Here's a summary of all the clips, just so you can think about the case uh, in, it, in its entirety. All right, we got two more to go. Case number nine, 14-year-old male presents by EMS with multiple gunshot wounds. Blood pressure is 78 over 45, so low. Heart rate's high, respiratory rate high. SpO2 a bit low, temperature's normal. Wow, this looks remarkably similar to the other sub view that we saw. So is, it, is this positive or negative? This is the uh, right upper quadrant of the patient. So we have liver, kidney, spine, diaphragm. So ask yourself, is there free fluid? Is there, the, is there a spine sign or any signs of hemothorax or any other signs of injury? Another view of the right upper quadrant. Ooh. Any free fluid? Any signs of injury? Another view of the right upper quadrant. Left upper quadrant. Spleen, kidney. Any fluid around the spleen or above the diaphragm? Now remember, there's a spleenorenal ligament, so we don't look for fluid between the spleen and the kidney. That's a big difference between left and right. We're looking for fluid around the spleen. Sagittal pelvis view, bladder, this is all intestine up here. Do you see free fluid anterior to the bladder? Transverse bladder, and looking posterior, posterior to the bladder. If I could improve this image, I would ask them to turn the gain down, please. Right and left lungs. Plural line here, sliding and common tails. Plural line here. Hmm, looks a bit different. Where in the fast are there signs of trauma?
So, no. Yes, 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 yes. Right? We're going to review those clips in a second. If this patient had a negative fast and you still were concerned for hemorrhagic shock, in what other spaces could the patient be losing blood? You can lose blood a lot of places. Let's see if I can think of all the other spaces. So with ultrasound, we can rule out blood in the chest, hemothorax. We can rule out blood in the lungs, like uh, pulmonary contusions with looking for bee lines. We can look for blood in the intra-abdominal space. We cannot look for, and we can look for blood in the pericardial space. We are not going to see blood if it's in the head, or if it's retroperitoneal, or if it's in the thigh, like for a femur fracture, or in the gluteal region. You can lose your whole blood volume in the gluteal region. We won't be able to see that probably well with ultrasound. You can also bleed out in the street. So if you get shot or stabbed, there can be blood at the scene, right? And we're not going to see that with ultrasound, but we will see signs of hypovolemic shock. So this patient had a hemothorax on the right. There's no lung sliding. You can see there's a little sliding or something here. So this would be like where the lung point is. If you don't remember what lung point is, it's a good time to review. And uh, with these other ones, this patient had a gunshot wound that went through the liver. And all this hyperechoic stuff is probably bubbles inside the liver from that air that tracked within it. And if you want to go back and review the other clips, you had progressive clips that showed you free fluid at the sort of tip of the kidney in Morrison's pouch. And there's really sort of subtle amount of anechoic fluid in Morrison's area. Left, left upper quadrant had fluid all the way around the spleen and maybe above the diaphragm as well, but not not enough to convince me that there's hemothorax. I'd have to see a better view. I think this is all blood around the spleen and definitely blood here, anterior and posterior to the bladder. This is blood here, posterior to the bladder. Really would have been a better picture if they turned the gain down. Last but not least, we have a 15 year old male who presents for shortness of breath and chest pain. Blood pressure, 140 over 90, heart rate 130, respiratory rate 30, SpO2 is 90%, temperature is normal. On exam, you have respiratory distress, crackles bilaterally in the lung exam, the oscillatory exam. There's no JVD, no peripheral edema, tachycardia, but regular with systolic and diastolic murmurs. Hmm. Here is the right lung. So there's a real patient, came to UC Davis. So I think, I hope, I hope we all agree that uh, the pleura is up, there's no pneumothorax, and there are lots of bee lines. Oh, left lung apex, man, please turn the gain down. But we still see pleura up here and we see lots of bee lines coming through. Here's the inferior vena cava. So remember, uh, liver is here. This is the uh, hepatic vein, so we want to look a couple centimeters back from the hepatic vein, like right here, to evaluate whether it's collapsing or not. And this is the right atrium. So if you look here, is the inferior vena cava collapsing or not? And how does that sort of impact your decision making? This was a challenging patient to ultrasound. Here's a parasternal long. Hard to see exactly what the anatomy is, but I'll tell you this is the left atrium, left ventricles here. This is the aortic outflow tract. We'll get another view in a moment. But even with this limited, limited assessment, no big pericardial fluid collection I can see. And the contractility of the heart, I mean, looks relatively good. I mean, th that thing's moving. Another attempt at a parasternal long left ventricle here, left atrium here. Pretty good squeeze, actually. Squeezing. Parasternal short, so this is the left ventricle looking like a donut. And you just have to ask yourself, is there a pericardial fluid collection and how well is that muscle moving? sub -xiphoid view. Look anteriorly for those fluid collections, for those pericardial fluid collections. Is there one? Mm, yes, there is a small one. Right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium. This is the mitral valve here. Anything unusual about that mitral valve? Again, the contractility of that muscle looks good. Apical four chamber, left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium. What strikes me about this particular clip is that the left atrium, very similar size to left ventricle, not normal.
and that mitral valve. How would you describe that if you were describing that over the phone? Another view, apical four chamber. Let's say with similar information, left ventricle, left atrium, right ventricle, right atrium, mitral valve. And some color flow for fun. We can see very turbulent flow going through the mitral valve. No significant uh, uh, regurge that I can see. Maybe there's a jet right there actually. Yeah, so some regurgitation as well, yep. All right, what's the most likely diagnosis? I definitely tried to lead you down a path and that path was mitral stenosis. I think it'd be very easy when you see this patient in real life to think it's all CHF because you have bilateral B lines. In an older, per in an older person, say the patient is like 55, 65, and you see bilateral B lines, it's gonna be like CHF almost all the time. This, these were, uh, I was making pediatric cases, uh, but uh, this patient easily could have been like 55 years old and you could have been misled and done a completely wrong treatment because this patient has mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis gives you B lines because the blood just backs up into the lungs, but it's not a heart contraction problem. How do you think the patient acquired this disease? If you said infection, you are correct. This is a patient who had rheumatic heart disease. Um, they were not born in the United States. They were born somewhere else. They were born in a low resource health setting, I'll say. What is the best initial management strategy? So if you thought the patient had heart failure, you would say after the reduction of BiPAP, but the patient does not have that. They have a mitral stenosis, an acute um, valvular problem, and they actually need preload reduction, see, opposite, and BiPAP. So they need ventilatory support because they're hypoxic and they're doing really poorly. They need uh, less fluid stressing their heart. And then um, really what they need really what they need is a valve replacement. That is what they need. They have critical mitral valve stenosis. That valve, if I was describing it over the phone, I would say it looks very hyperechoic. It looks immobile. It looks thickened, calcified. It looks like it's barely moving at all. If you go back and look at those clips, they need mitral valve replacement. So look at these mitral valve now in retrospect, right here, so hyperechoic and thick, and it's just going, it should be opening up 100%, not just stuck in place. But you can see in all the views, it looks very stuck together, stuck in place. That's a classic case of rheumatic heart disease. A case that I see very often when I work in Uganda and other places. So to summarize, when you have a patient shock, ultrasound is indicated because it helps us rapidly categorize that state of shock and helps us start immediate correct treatment and we don't get led down these sort of false paths. So if the patient has hypovolemia or dehydration or blood loss, the heart will be hypercontractile with a small chamber size, unlike cardiogenic shock where you have hypercontractile heart in a large chamber size. In obstructive shock, they usually be hypercontractile, but you're looking for pericardial effusions. That's the main thing. And you can look for uh, right ventricular heart strain or right ventricular dilation in the setting of a uh, pulmonary embolism. In distributive shocks such as sepsis, you'll be hypercontractile early on, but later on you may have a lot of um, cardiac dysfunction due to circulating cytokines and you can have cardiac dysfunction or a hypocontractile heart. In hypovolemia, you have a small IVC, unlike cardiogenic or obstructive shock where it'll be distended or plethoric IVC and then uh, it can be normal or small, usually in sepsis. The lungs in hypovolemia will be normal unless you have a hemothorax. Cardiogenic shock, we tend to see B lines bilaterally and uh, pleural effusions bilaterally, um, but not always. In obstructive shock, we're looking for lung sliding because we want to rule out attention pneumothorax. And in distributive shock, uh, we're really just looking for etiology such as consolidations from pneumonia. I hope that was helpful going through some of these cases um, of shock and uh, FAST exams. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to contact me or follow me, follow me on Twitter. 
And I hope all of you stay well during this COVID pandemic, but uh, we must continue learning and moving forward.